Okay, thank you everyone to um, come to the Magnet uh, Seminar. Uh, today is gonna be, um, it's gonna be um, by Sayoa Arquero Campunzano. Uh, she's gonna present the evolution of the Jamanti field for the last three millennia from the Shauk Iron Age and Shauk 2K reconstructions from the Lantine Iron Age and South Atlantic anomalies. Sayoa is, uh, she's based in Madrid. As a um, seminar format, as usual, we have 25 minutes presentation. Um, then we will have about 10, 15 minutes for question discussion. We're always flexible. You can always um, write your questions in the text box. Uh, it's an informal environment, so if you want to go, uh, don't worry about it. You can go. The seminars are recorded, and there'll be some time at the end of the seminar to catch up. This will not be recorded. So for now, I would like to uh, give uh, Sayoa the, the ball, start the presentation. Okay. Okay. Did you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, and the pointer? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. And thank you for this opportunity to present our work about the emergence and evolution of the geomagnetic field for the last three millennia. And the, this, this work is about the emergence and evolution of two uh, magnetic anomalies, the Levantine Iron Age anomaly and the South Atlantic anomaly from global reconstruction of the paleomagnetic field. This work has been developed for the, by the group of paleomagnetism of the Complutense University of Madrid, and I'm going to present the main results. So first, we have to know who our principal actresses are. The Levantine Iron Age anomaly is a large positive anomaly related to very high values and fast variation of the geomagnetic field intensity at the Earth's surface between 1000 BC and 700 BC in the Levantine region, according to Sar et al. Uh, 2016. In, the, in two, 2017, Sar et al. observed prominent high uh, virtual axial dipole moment values in the chain frame of the Levantine Iron Age anomaly in orange in these figures, not only in the Levant region, but also in Caucasus and Turkmenistan, but much lower values in Greece and, Bulga and Bulgaria. In the period between uh, 500 BC and 200 BC in green in the figure, we also observe a second pal intensity high in all, um, in all regions um, related, in this case, with a fast secular variation in Europe. So, um, so in, at, at um, continental scale. Regarding the first height, that is to say the Levantine Iron Age anomaly, they conclude that a non-dipole feature is required to explain the pal intensity difference in the interval between 1000 BC and 700 BC between Caucasus Levant and the Balkans. Also in this year, in 2017, Davis and Constable uh, proposed a spike model to explain these high values at the Earth's surface. In a very quick way, they insert a spike into the radial component of the geomagnetic field at the Kormantel boundary here in the AE figure. Uh, in the Levant region and in te the Texas region, and, and this spike is modeled like um, Fisher mom misses probability distribution, and they model the geomagnetic field with these characteristics. The model shows that the instantaneous surface expression, this is the intensity uh, um, at the Earth's surface, the model shows that the instantaneous surface expression of high uh, intensities must extend over a broad geographical area estimated to be around 60 degrees of longitude. They also suggest that the Levantine geomagnetic spike reflects an intense and localized near equatorial flux patch uh, on the core mantle boundary emerged from within the core and subsequently decayed in the same place or grew in the equatorial region and migrated northwards and westwards. 
for that part of uh, the, for your part, the South Atlantic anomalies are region with a low values of geomagnetic field intensity at the air surface. It covers the most part of South America, South Atlantic Ocean, and South Africa. Its internal origin is associated with the presence of reversal flux patches at the Coromantel boundary from 1840, but they could be older. Here, we can see the intensity at the Earth, uh, at the Earth's surface and the radial component of the radial uh, of, um, of the geomagnetic field at the core mantle boundary. Uh, in January 2020, from Chaos model, so from a model derived uh, by satellite data and instrumental data, the white line contour gives an idea about the aerial extent of the South Atlantic anomaly at the present days. And with the black square, we see the two reversal flux patches here and here, located beneath South America and South Africa, commonly associated with uh, this or internal origin of the South Atlantic anomaly. In detail, we can see this movie uh, with the evolution of the intensity at the air and the earth surface and the radial component of the geomagnetic field at the core mantle boundary from 1600 AD uh, until our days, uh, the present days. And we can see very well the relationship between between this anomaly at uh, the air surface and these reversal, reversal flux patches at the core mantle boundary. But the question here is, what is the real age of these uh, reversal flux patches and in charge of the South Atlantic anomaly? In the few last uh, in the few years, in the, few, in the last few years, sorry, several works point out that they could be older than we thought. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the results provided by our group the last year, which proposed, this is a spoiler, that the reversal flux patches could emerge around 950 AD. So, to understand better uh, the nature of these anomalies, the, the Levantine Iron Age anomaly and the South Atlantic anomaly, we must start from paleomagnetic data. We can see here the spatial and temporal distribution of the archaeomagnetic and volcanic database coming from Geomagia, Geomagia 50, the last version, for the last 3,000 years. And we see, for example, in the time distribution panel, so uh, this panel shows a decrease in the number of declination and inclination um, values during the first millennia before Christ. Uh, not so important in the case of the intensity and in a space we can see very well that the data are clearly concentrated in the northern hemisphere but the recent incorporation uh, of intensities from Africa and from South America um, uh, improves the spatial coverage in the southern hemisphere. In addition, new data coming from the Iberian Peninsula prior to uh, late Iron Age times, an epoch very poorly constrained up to date, and very interesting because it's the Levantine Iron Age um, anomaly times, have been also incorporated in this database. From this figure, we can also see uh, another effect. Effect. The effect of uh, applying quality criteria on the data. Light colors represent quality data and dark colors represent the rest of the paleomagnetic data. So uh, we can see that the intensity is the parameter most affected with a very scarce number of quality data in light colors here. But what means quality data for us? We use uh, quality criteria based on uh, three, three principal aspects. The first one is the type of material analyzed. We choose uh, archaeomagnetic and volcanic material for the analysis of these um, rapid anomalies in the case of the Levantine, especially in the case of the Levantine Iron Age anomaly. Uh, the number of specimens uh, that we consider uh, is a minimum of four specimens. And the laboratory protocol used for the estimation of the pali intensity is also considered. 
we um, we required that the quality that the quality data correspond to intensity values coming from experiments based on the Tellier Tellier type methods, including PTRM checks, and uh, in the case um, if they were obtained from potentially highly anisotropic archaeological objects such as pottery or ceramics the TRM anisotropy correction is also required. This is not the case, for example, um, for volcanic data. So, unfortunately, there is currently not enough quality data to obtain a robust global reconstruction of the geomagnetic field using only the quality data for the last 3,000 years. For this reason, we propose the use of the complete database not only the quality data, but we use, we propose to use an appropriated weighting scheme. To do that, the most difficult problem is to establish the relative ratio between the weight of the quality data and the other paleomagnetic data. To quantify this radio, we constructed different geomagnetic field models using different weighting schemes from one to 100. Uh, within ratios. From these models, we um, calculated declination, inclination, and intensity data at the same location than those corresponding to the quality data in the original database. We then compare the prediction of the model with the real data and we calculate the, uh, the root mean square error. For different regularization given by different damping parameters, alpha and tau, here we can see different trade off curves. Um, and we see very well this knee point in the trade of cars uh, around 10. So this, uh, this uh, wasting scheme, this means that the quality data weighs 10 times more than the rest of the polymagnetic data is the best compromise between the modeling fitting and the proposed wasting scheme. So with this consideration, um, we uh, generate uh, two different reconstructions of the geomagnetic field. For modeling purposes, we followed the same approach as the work of Corte and Constable 2005, uh, the spherical harmonic analysis technique in space, and the penalized cubic D splines in time. We select the maximum degree of the harmonic expansion uh, equal to 10, and we fix the temporal knot points every 25 years. In order to estimate model uncertainties, a BUSA technique is used following Corte and Constable 2008. And we uh, calculate 5,000 models by perturbing the input data with two random distribution. A Gaussian distribution centering the mean directional and intensity values with a standard deviation um, equal to the uncertainty of the data, and uh, an homogeneous distribution centering the main age of the data with an amplitude equal to the uncertainty. So the inversion was regularized also at the Kormanser boundary by means of the damping parameters alpha and tau, and with this consideration, we have generated these two reconstructions of the geomagnetic field. Tau so, chiron 8 from 1300 BC to 0 AD and Tau so, 2 K from uh, 100 BC to 1900 AD. The first one is, uh, is generated to uh, study the uh, Levantine ion age anomaly, and the second one is generated in order to study uh, the uh, South Atlantic anomaly, the emergence and evolution. So, from South Chiron 8, we see maps of intensity at the air surface in different years. During the first years of the model, we see moderate values of the intensity around over the Levant uh, region, around 60 microtesla. Around 900 BC, high values of the intensity around 80 microteslas are observed with an apparent migration in northwestwards from 700 BC and 500 BC. And around 300 BC, we see lower values again. So, 
the observed high intensity at their surface uh, corresponding with the Levantine Iron Age anomaly can be associated to a flux patch of normal polarity here of the radial component of the geomagnetic field at the Kormantel boundary. And we see, um, we see at about 1000 BC, an isolated normal flux patch is located below the Levant rayon here that grows up in situ. And then it expands towards the northwest, the northwest while decreasing intensity. I try to put the movie again. So we see uh, this expansion, uh, expansion towards the northwest while decreasing intensity yeah, at around 700 BC. The center is located in Europe. And from 300, uh, 300 BC, the, the normal flux patch is vanishing in situ. So due to the non-dipolar nature of the Levantine Iron Age anomaly, we have also analyzed the non-dipolar terms of the humanistic field. And we observe more or less the same ev evolution of this normal patch, uh, normal flux patch at the Cormantel boundary with a migration northwestward from 1000 BC to 700 BC. For SAUC to K reconstruction, we can see the emergence of the reversal flux patch related to the South Atlantic anomaly. Here, we can see the evolution of the radial component at the core mantle boundary for different times. As we can see, an area of reversed polarity located beneath the India penetrated from the magnetic equator and moved away um, southwest from 1000 AD to 1300 AD. And in, mil, in 1700 AD, it was isolated beneath South Africa and started to shift westwards until reaching the South Atlantic Ocean in 1900 AD. So here, according to the International Humanity Reference Field, uh, 12, uh, the south re reversal flux patch um, is divided into two different uh, reversal flux patches, one located in Patagonia and the second one located under South Africa here and here. So recent studies indicate that nowadays the Patagonian area is B is vanishing and the South African area is B is reinforcing. It, this is, we can see this feature here. Our new reconstruction does not have enough resolution to establish if the strong westward movement of this uh, South uh, reversal flux patch observed between 1700 AD to 1900 AD corresponds to a real movement of a single or two close reversal flux patches. In addition to the, this um, reversal flux, flux patch related to the South Atlantic anomaly, we can see another reversal flux patch located in the northern hemisphere here, with this N in the, in the figure. So, uh, this uh, reversal flux patch was also identified by another author, by other authors, Serrano et al. in 2015, around 1500 AD. And our study suggests that the emergence of this um, NRAP occurred between 1000 AD here and 1400 AD here when a tongue of reversal polarity penetrated from the magnetic equator towards the North Atlantic. And this, um, this NRAP drift northeast and appeared clearly isolated around 1600 AD beneath the United Kingdom and the Scandinavian region, where it remaining up to the date, up to now. Uh, this, uh, this north uh, reversal flux patch is vanishing at present times, as we can see with, uh, with these figures given by the International Humanity Reference Field. 
So this intriguing asymmetric, anti-symmetric evolution of the north reversal flux patch related to the south reversal flux patch. So we'll be investigating in more detail in future. And finally, in order to evaluate the non-dipole contributions to these uh, reversal flux patches, we have also calculated the the radial component of the geomagnetic field at the Kormanter boundary for different orders. So consider dipole, quad, adding quadruple, octuple, and with a maximum degree equal to six. In this figure, we saw the results obtained for 1700 KD when the south reversal flux patch is isolated. So we can clearly observe that both north and south patches are mainly due to harmonic degrees greater than three. But um, in the case of the south reversal flux patch, it's very important also the quadruple and octuple contributions because they break the symmetry of the dipole, the net south uh, Africa. In the case of the north reversal flux patch, is exclusively due to non-dipole terms of higher degree, as we can see here in the in this figure. So. To conclude, just two, two points or two thoughts. The first one is that it seems to the use of an appropriate, appropriate weighting scheme based on uh, data accuracy seems to improve our in understanding of the path of the geomagnetic field. And the second one is something that we know very well is that we need more data, more data to analyze features of our geomagnetic field and in particular to analyze in detail the emergence and evolution of, this, of these anomalies. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sayoa. Let's give her a good uh, round of applause. Um, so we have a couple of questions already in the chat box. One is from uh, Lisa, and she is concerning the, the data selection. She's asking, what do you do about cooling rate corrections when you select the In this data? case, we don't use the cooling rate corrections, only the anisotropic correction, because it's not very clear the, the real uh, influence of this, uh, of this um, cooling rate correction in, in, all the in, in, all, in all type of data. So in this case, we prefer to use only the this this other this other criteria. Lisa, do you have something to add? No, oh, I mean if if you look for perfect data, you'll get maybe one data point. So I understand. It's just it it can be a larger effect than anisotropy and it's just and we don't know how to do it so i was just asking thank you okay thank um, you. so that we have another question from uh, andrei kostarov um and he asked can you estimate a deviation of field direction from the expected dipole values due to the uh, levantine anomaly uh sorry can you repeat anita please? yeah sorry can you estimate a deviation of mm -hmm. field direction from the expected dipole values due to the Levantine Iron Age anomaly? In this case, we, we center our study in the intensity. So yes, we analyze also the directional part of the geomagnetic field, but in, with this detail, I am analyzing the, the intensity. But it's interesting because in the last year, um, new directional data uh, from, from Germany um, uh, has been publi published. So it's interesting also to study the evolution of the direction in this Levantine Iron Age anomaly. Okay. Thank you. D uh, any other questions? from the audience. Andre says, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no more questions? 
Well, then thank you very much oh, for I, your I presentation. Oh, you have a question. Have a question. Oh, there we go. Oh, great. The, the um, last minute. <laughs> So I guess this is just a, a, a comment really in terms or a question in terms of how do you think that the uh, the resolution of the data uh, mm -hmm. that's available in, in the Levant region uh, and the surrounding areas, how does this spatial and temporal resolution, how do you think that actually influences uh, what you're seeing in your models and you know how much of an effect does uh, yeah. the model smoothing have? Yes, this is an interesting question. Uh, in the case of the SAUC uh, uh, 2K, we use only the archimagnetic and volcanic data. Also in the last year, in 1900 AD, and if you compare with the data, with the model, with, with the international humanitarian reference field that use only instrumental data and satellite data, we see that it's very similar. So. Yes, of course, in the in earlier times, uh, this influence is very important. And this is the reason also uh, to do this kind of criteria quality before the modeling, the modeling procedure. And we also filter considering other statistical parameters, not only the quality of the data in terms of number of specimens and number or type of material, or laboratory protocol. We also uh, filter in, uh, observe, for, for example, the, the alpha 95 and the error associated with the intensity. So yes, uh, yes, it's, it's important, this kind of analysis, previous the, the generation of the model, yes. But this is interesting, the comparison between these two plots. I think that it's very relevant to obtain the same result with the archaeomagnetic and volcanic data and with instrumental and, and satellite data. So. so I have a question. Um, yes. Because you're using Geomagia, mm -hmm. you don't, don't even have the most recent, most of the data for the Levantine Iron Age yes. and which was published later, including hmm. the Georgia results that you refer to. So um, maybe you should supplement those data with the stuff that's in MAGIC, which is much more complete. Um, uh, and secondly, I would love to put Shaw Q into uh, PMAGPI, but I don't have access to Elsevier journals because I'm at a University of California, huh. and I believe it must be in your supplemental um, is it, is it in the supplemental uh, um, material? Uh, I can send you, if you want, I can send the paper and the supplementary material and, all you, <laughs> and everything you want. <laughs> yeah, put it someplace where it's open, like in... Yes, yes. This. Also in the, in the white side of the paleomagnetic group, uh, I, I think that it's a good place to put this these uh, models and these these codes. Put it in Erda, where where Kathy puts all of her models, um, just to collect them somewhere so we can okay. have them, <laughs> use them, um, uh, and uh, nice work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, for the for the question. It's really important for all of us to share the data, so yes, of course. we can yes. collaborate in the best and more consistent and clear way if possible we can. Um, so we have a, a, a question in the chat from Anik, maybe Anik Chauvin, I don't know. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I saw some differences between your maps of BR at the Kermant boundary and, mm -hmm. and those published by Terra Nova, Terra Nova. Do you think, do you have some explanation, sorry? Yes, because in this case, we include uh, more data than in the Terra Nova et al. 2015 uh, publication. So, in, especially in the South Atlantic and the, in, the, in South Africa and, so in, and South America. So this is the difference, this inclusion of new data here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kathy? As a question, you can go ahead and mute yourself. Yes, uh, nice presentation. Hi. Um, I'm you. curious 
if you made a model where you didn't downweight the data that you considered to be of low quality and how that would compare with what you ended up with? Uh, where exactly, Kathy? Sorry. So um, you you showed us this slide where you evaluated downweighting the data that you considered yes, this were one? of low quality. Yeah, and and I'm wondering if you looked at the results from not downweighting things and how uh, they yes. compared mm -hmm. with what you ended up with. Yes, we we generate also a model considering this uh, weighting ratio equal to one. That mm -hmm. is the absence of this quality weighting scheme, and we 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 see uh, we saw um, difference in the especially in the South Atlantic part in the in the emergence of this in the observation of this evolution of the reversal flux patch because the south africa and south america data have um our quality data and they are very scarce so the the influence of the this quality data increase a lot when you consider this weighting ratio and you observe um, better this this evolution but we we can see also the evolution with the with the, uh, the other model but it's not so clear that when we consider the this weighting scheme so uh, but we um, in yes if i i i can share um, all these um models and also this this other model is present in the supplementary material of this paper so so yes, in the next future, <laughs> I want to share <laughs> all the coefficients, Gauss coefficients, in order to put all free and and yes, and stay with the community. That would be great. And and so just to be clear, the weighting is the only way. The weighting of quality versus not good quality is the only way that you include the uncertainty in the observations you don't weight them by the uncertainties assigned by the original data providers yes yeah, we we consider the uncertainty of the data only in the bootstrap method and okay. and we when we filter the data uh, after this weighting scheme in the sense that we we have uh, done this weighting scheme in order to classify the quality of the data but um, based on different uh, a different way and in mm. the classical filters that we use for example consider the error of intensity data and we filter in order to not underestimate or overestimate the some data and these kind of things we also do this before the the um, the modeling process so we include all these and the weighting scheme is included in the sorry because he is absent but here we include the weighting scheme like a waste uh, matrix mm -hmm. uh, uh, with ones and tens uh, depending on the on the quality data thank you thank you thank you we have another question in the chat box it's from joe stoner and uh, he asks how do you test these reconstructions what predictions might you have made that we as data producers could try to check i can repeat mm -hmm. so how do you test these reconstructions that's the question so what prediction might you make that we as a data producers could try to check okay uh the test of these reconstructions are Okay, for example, no, here, no. We use Joey, the, root, the, cal the calculate the estimation of the root mean square compare in comparison for the, the model uh, data with the original database. And we calculate the root mean square. And this is the test that we use. And if this um, 
this uh, root mean square error is very close to one, we consider that the model is, uh, is doing a well work. Okay, thank you. Joe, do you want to ask something else? Concerning um, data? Well, I, I was just, yeah, curious if we, you know, can, can use these, I mean, obviously we can get predictions at different locations and try to see how well different types of data might reproduce what you expect based on these reconstructions. Um, if there is things in progress, especially data that's not, say, um, within the model. So, you know, can we use sedimentary records as ways of testing what you might expect? Hmm. Yes, yes, I understand. Yes, I, I see your point. Yes, we can, in this case, we don't um, calculate this kind of test. So we only calculate the root mean square like uh, the previous way that I mentioned. But yes, if you, with new data, uh, you can see if uh, these uh, models works well. It's uh, for me, to be honest, I think that, for example, if you uh, increase the number of data, uh, of quality data in regions, for example, here in the Mediterranean region, the, uh, where these data are not very quality data, uh, it's possible that this model do doesn't work very well here. But depends on the on the data. This is the reason why I, I think that it's very important to increase the number of polymagnetic data and also the quality, the quality data. So, yes. Okay, thank you. So I just wanted thank to follow you. up on Joe's comment. Uh, if you want to make a comparison with the sedimentary data, mm -hmm. one of the issues that uh, would be important would be for the sediment data gatherers to provide an estimate of the temporal resolution in the sedimentary data, because if there's smoothing as a result of the uh, remnants acquisition, then you wouldn't expect these models to agree that well, because they just make predictions that would be scattered about the sediment curve. So this is something Mm -hmm. that uh, that we actually tried to incorporate, we incorporated in the GGF 100K model. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that when you, when you make a prediction, you have to take account of the remnants acquisition process in order to get some kind of accurate result. And we actually built that into the modeling process uh, to allow for that in there. So uh, sediment data collectors, that we really need to know that. Sounds like a challenge. Mm -hmm. Happy. Thank you for, for uh, this point. I would uh, follow up also on, on Lisa's uh, comment of before that another good thing that uh, we as data producer can do is make the original data available so that yeah. so you can you can have, for instance, as a sedimentary sequence, you have depth, you have age, where the age came from in centimeter wide. You can in the near future or far future, we can always reconstruct uh, maybe a new age model compared to what we did 10 years ago or something, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. I okay. agree. So we <laughs> have completely agree with you. <laughs> Hi, I would have a question too. Hi. Hi, Nokia. Thank for this nice presentation. Thanks. I was wondering somehow you have controlled the quality of the dating of uh, your data. I mean, how reliable is the dating? Because very often we have very high quality data and excellent uh, laboratory results, but uh, the dating is not so reliable. And, uh, I am afraid that's often the case for both volcanic rocks and uh, maybe electromagnetic material. So I don't know yes. if you have the way to control the reliability of the dating. Yes, in, the, in these models, I, I must say that we only uh, use a filter of the uncertainty of the age, consider uh, 2050 years like the maximum uncertainty of age that we consider well. 
So for us, uh, then the data that we use in this uh, paleomagnetic reconstructions only consider the data with an uncertainty of age lesser than 2,500 uh, years. Yes, of course, uh, the, the best solution is to see, to, to prove, to, to see in detail every day, every data, and yes, and see if the, the dating is well or not, or what problems <laughs> there are, yes, of course. But in the case of the, these models, uh, we use only this filter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one uh, one uh, question from Melissa in the chat. How does the shao compare to the Chinese data of Kai et al. from China? We use the Kai et al. data in these in these uh, reconstructions, so it's included. In fact, if we see these no, you going to 2015 so there's more from china and so it would be ah, okay hmm. but I mean, we can see for example this this uh patch uh -huh. uh, at the cormantel boundary that's interesting because we don't see if there is some connection between these two normal flux patches so in the case of the Levantine Iron Age uh, anomaly. So it's something that we, we want to, to investigate in detail in the future. And this is due to this Kai et al. data. It's Tsai, not Kai. Tsai, sorry. Oh. I don't... Sorry. <laughs> I, I cannot speak in Chinese. <laughs> I can't either. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you very much to all. Uh, I think for today we can wrap up and um, another big round of applause for Sayo for her presentation. Thank um, you very much. I'm going to share the screen uh, yep. <laughs> with you for the last. Uh, uh, share. Okay. Can you see my screen? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Okay, so just to uh, conclude our um, our seminar of today, uh, we have some uh, um, information for you. The video, this recording and past recording are now available on this website. Uh, this link we sh we shared it already with you. It's on the Earthref Magic database, and now it, it can be citable through Earthref as well. As a schedule, we have the next uh, uh, seminar will be the 25th of November. It will be by <clears throat> Evdokia Tema. Um, and then December, we will have to have a break. There is going to be AGU for um, about 10 days, and there's going to be Christmas. So we are going to take a break. And, and then for 2021, we are looking for speakers. So if anyone wants to volunteer or volunteer somebody else, it's um, Everybody's welcome. Um, feedback, ideas, criticism are always welcome to me, Greg. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then uh, thank you very much to all. <laughs>